I encourage everyone to take a moment and breathe and take a tea cheers with a Jiri tea. A Jiri tea recognizes the beauty in shared stories and shared opportunities. Ajiri sources award-winning tea from Kenya, employs women in the region to handcraft the labels, and sends 100% of the profits back to the region to support orphan education. Save 10% on your order of Kenyan teas and coffee with the code BEAUTIFULLYHUMAN at ajiritea.com. A-J-I-R-I-T.com. Tea mugs up! Hello, and welcome to the Beautifully Human podcast. I'm Nick Sheesby. In this podcast, I speak with beautiful humans from all around the world, sharing with you their incredible stories, revealing the power in every human story to spread love and humanity to a world that is in desperate need of it, to show that we can all connect in beautiful ways, no matter where we come from or what we look like. What you will find out is that we are all beautifully human. Let's all be beautifully human. Welcome into another episode of the Beautifully Human podcast. I am Nick Sheesby. Today I have on with me an amazing human named Danny Levin. He tells us all about the concept in his life that is called the mosaic. It is really beautiful. His journey is really incredible. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Uh, If you enjoy this podcast, go to Apple Podcasts and rate and review. It does help uh, follow on Spotify so you get those notifications. And again, enjoy this episode. It's a really, really amazing one. Do you go by Danny or Daniel? Um, Only on my book is it Daniel. And so I'm not grown up enough to be Daniel in real life. Yeah, that's kind of, I, I very rarely hear my name is Nicholas. And then I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm just Nick. So yeah, cool. Well, Danny, I appreciate you coming on here, man. I, I am excited to hear your journey and your story. So I'm, I'm super happy to be speaking with you. Times your excitement by 10 and you have <laughs> me. I, I, I love you. I love your brother. And I'm so, what an honor to be here with you. And thank you so much for having me and sharing your platform with me. It's uh it means the world to me. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. I I was looking at um, your profile and just all the 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 stuff that you have done. I I love. I when I saw it, I just thought, man, he has lived life. So so tell me about your life that you've lived. Yeah, you know, I I always from a kid saw life differently than other people. And even though I was able to play the game that people played, I was popular, I played sports, I had lots of friends and stuff. There was something about my life that I never really felt connected to, to this world. I never really understood what this world was all about because everybody saw the world one way and I saw it a different way. And so it was a little alienating for me, the ability that I had. Um, And so it was exasperated when I lost my parents. My dad died when I was 13 years old, making love to my mom. And my mom died two years later on exactly the same day at exactly the same time, because that's how connected she was. And I remember reading in her journal before she went into sort of a coma, only a couple more days now, Al, I'll be with you. So she knew exactly what she was doing and getting getting herself ready to be with him again. And as much as she loved us, this love that she shared with my dad knew no borders or no boundaries, knew no dimension, even from living to dead, they were still connected. And so it put in me some sort of different way, again, of seeing the world than most of my friends were just playing ball and chasing girls, you know, sure. which, which I did a little too, but... Um, there was the sense to me of what is it all for? It all passes so quickly. And it was only in writing the mosaic five years ago when I started writing it that I realized that when my parents passed away, I asked the adults who were the smartest people that I knew where my parents were. Mm. And they told me they were in a place called heaven. So I set out on this journey to find heaven. 
and the mosaic is a fabulized version of my life and the people that I met along the way. And so I had this opportunity when my parents passed away, I moved in with my aunt and uncle. My uncle was a household name around the world. Everyone knew his name and he had no sons. So he said, this might be a great opportunity for both of us because 50 years ago, you didn't give your business to your daughters, even if they were smart and intelligent and fabulous. Sure. It just wasn't something was done. And thank God that's changed, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, thank God. So, but um, he offered me the opportunity to mentor me and have me in 15 years take over his multi billion dollar corporation. That was 50 years ago. So you can only imagine where it would be now or where it is now. Wow. And I walked away from that because I didn't find what I realized only in writing the mosaic. It wasn't the heaven I was looking for. I went to, I went to college and I studied with the, my mentor was the man who started organizational psychology. Psychology when before that was just laying on a couch and having a person talk to you as an individual. And he said, well, if it's working for people, well, there are people in corporations and organizations too. So why don't we do organizational psychology? psychology and I want you to be my protege because I'm getting older I want to hand it over to you so another opportunity where someone getting older saw something in me that they wanted to hand to me yeah but I didn't find the answers to my questions in the practice of psychology so I set out and hitchhiked around the world and I sat on street corners with the with the simplest of people and and I sat in boardrooms with the most elite people always looking for what would be the answer, what was the meaning, what was the purpose of what I was doing here. And as much as I enjoyed those moments, as much as people would sit and gather around me and we would have these incredible moments together on the street corners of some city that I never been to, that wasn't the heaven I was looking for either. I went into rabbinical school and studied to be a rabbi. And one day before I was to be ordained, I left because it wasn't the heaven I was looking for. I started a business and many businesses and, and made good money. Um, it wasn't the business. It wasn't the heaven I was looking for. I went into a monastery and lived 10 years as a monk, sitting in meditation, sometimes as many as 18 hours a day, sometimes 10 hours a day, sometimes five minutes a day but it didn't matter but each day was filled for the last 45 years has been touched by the grace of that presence and even that wasn't the heaven i was looking for because i hated that i would have that presence when i was sitting alone in my in my solitude but that i would lose it the minute i walked outside the door and i would hear people yelling at each other and i there was nothing i could do to make that to make the love that i felt help the love that, of these people. And so I, I, I realized there has to be some other way. I went to Hay House and I helped it grow from $3 million to $100 million a year. I sat with the most influential people in the world. And I was the one they came to when they had problems because I looked at them horizontally, not vertically. I wanted nothing from them. And I saw that the heaven I was looking for wasn't there either. So it was only a few years ago, and I'm a 65 year old man, that I understood my heaven through the art of writing the mosaic. My heaven became that moment when everything that I saw, suddenly I saw differently that momentary perceptual shift that allowed me to see the world differently than I ever had. And once I had done that, I, I left because I could have walked back into the business my uncle wanted to give me. I could have walked into organizational psychology. I could have walked into the businesses that I created and they all would have been heaven because the perceptual shift was all that was missing. Mm. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I mean that that's it's amazing. I love I love how you're phrasing it too of like you're you were looking for your heaven because that's where your parents were. And you know, I, I think in life so many people just struggle to find what it is that that 
that just even makes them happy or, or the, the sense of that. So I, I think it's a, a beautiful journey that you went on and you, you know, you phrased it in a different way, but you know, there's so many people that, that are in effect li- looking for that. And then you had all these incredible experiences and it was, you know, just all of a sudden a perception switch yeah. and it was like, Oh, well shit, there it was. Yeah. And so I love the way you brought it to a full circle because for anyone who is searching, what I would love to invite you to look at is what if it is not out here? What if it's not something to find? For me, it was just a perceptual shift that was inside me all the time. And in my book, The Mosaic, my search for my parents was also a perceptual shift. Because at the end of the book, without sort of putting a spoiler on it, um, what happens is Mo merges with, with the world. And his father tells him in the beginning, my time here with you is over. I've done what I came here to do. Others will come and help you now. Don't look at what they look like or don't look at what they do. Just feel who they are behind that. And as I saw all the pieces of my life that had come up to become a part of me, that had helped me along my journey, their faces instantly vanished into the faces of my dad and my mom. So they were with me all along, but their bodies weren't, weren't here. So I thought they were gone. But the spirit of them infused every single person that I met. And they weren't holy men and women. They were just regular, ordinary people, but so were we. Sure. But our spirit... Our spirit doesn't know the boundary of our body. We boundary our spirit in our body, but it doesn't care what we do. It lives beyond the boundaries that we give it. And the more that we can feel that just because the body dies doesn't mean the spirit dies. The more yeah. connected we can become to each other. Yeah, I and I, you know, I think more than any time in my lifetime that that is something that is is so needed right now is to like you said just not look at people for you know what they look like or this or that but to connect with that spirit of that person i I think that's so needed in this in this world right now more than again more than any time in my lifespan and what an honor it is to be one of those few that can do that like for those of us who can do it, what an honor and privilege we get. Because one of the things that I realized in traveling the way I have and meeting all these different people and having time with, with people is that no matter how rich a person is or poor, and I've sat at the dinner tables of the richest people in the world, and I've sat on street corners with the poorest of the poor, no matter what color their skin or what religion they practice or don't practice, no matter what border they live behind, no matter who they say they are or what they say they do, every single one of them wanted these three things. They wanted to be loved and accepted. They wanted to be listened to and heard. And they wanted to be acknowledged and validated. And when I realized I could do that, that became now the purpose of my life. I just hold the space for people to feel loved and accepted, listened to and heard and acknowledged and validated. And Nick, it's an amazing thing that happens sometimes when that happens. And it doesn't take long for it to happen. When people feel safe in that space, the walls that they put around themselves to protect themselves, they realize don't have any purpose now. So they set the walls down. And when we set the walls down that we carry with us to protect ourselves, all that's left is who we are. And in who we are, we see something we've never seen before. And you and I get to share when who you are and who I am dance together without the confines of the walls that we put around us to protect ourselves. That's when miracles start to happen, my brother. Yeah, it is. It, it it truly is just, just so beautiful. And, and I mean, you worded it so eloquently. But so afraid to get to that point, or to 
see other people in that way. And, you know, I, I think that's such a shame because like you said, that's w- when you let those walls down and it's just you standing there, it is just, it's a really freeing, unbelievable feeling in life. Yeah. yeah. And so, and I know exactly what you mean. And so I'm not trying to fix or change or, or but I just want to share my perspective with you. It's so perfectly understandable. And so Definitely. perfectly okay that people don't feel yet to do that. And, and when I have the opportunity to love and hold and embrace someone who doesn't feel that opportunity yet to do it, I am so honored again just to be able to say there's one little place in the world, perhaps there are many little pockets. They're, they're the spaces between the pieces of our mosaic that exist that I just want you to know, I'm always here for you, brother, sister. Whatever you need, I'm here. And if you ever feel just that you wanna be listened to and heard, that you wanna be loved and accepted, that you wanna be acknowledged and validated for what you believe in, without any sort of sense that I need to fix you or change you or help you or elevate you or make you anything other than you are, I'm always here for you. I have a link on my website. I have a link in my clubhouse account. I have a link everywhere that says, just just come and get me. I, I have a half an hour free conversation with anybody who just wants to be heard and loved and adored. And it's my honor to do that, free of charge. Yeah, and I mean, that, that's how we first connected. I did that as well, and I can say it was it was an amazing half an hour chat, and I'm, I'm loving getting to extend it right now. And you are right though, you know, I, it is totally understandable. You know, it, it took me a pretty substantial <laughs> experience in my life to open myself the way I have. But I mean, I love, I, I love it when I get to say to someone who doesn't think that they're, they're worthy to be on this podcast. And I, you know, I named it beautifully human, just not being like outwardly beautiful, not like, Oh, you're the most beautiful person in the world. But I mean, everyone loves to think they're beautiful. Sure. But my part of it was we are all beautifully human. And that human is, is the brokenness is, is the, the shit we bring. That's just there, you know, and that, that is beautiful. Even if I disagree with you or we have differing opinions, we're, we're, you're you're still beautifully human, you know? So I love, love I love love opening that space and, and, you know, like you said, everyone wants to be seen and heard and it is really rewarding when, when you get to sit with somebody and they tell us, tell a hell of a story of their life. That's, that's been tough or they've never outwardly shared it. And then they tell you, this was really comfortable. This was really yeah. nice. Like what a, what a beautiful, empowering feeling for, for yeah. you to be able to hear that from that person, even if it's that blip on their rate, you know, the timeline of their life, just to have that little openness. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Something just happened this morning that still lingers with me because it, it was, it was so powerful of an experience. I moderate a room on clubhouse called feel loved and accepted, listen to and heard. And it happens every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday at eight o'clock in the morning, California time. And it's starting to grow slowly, but I don't care about growing. I just, it's just more and more people are coming. But what's really beautiful was there was a woman that I had a conversation with before her because she took me up on my link to, to talk together. And she came into the room and she, he just said, um, I'm feeling the love in this room and I just have to say to you how much pain I'm in, how much hurt I'm experiencing because it seems like the people that quote unquote should love me just hate me. Mm. And so many people hate me. And she said, I feel like the purpose of my life is to be hated by the people that I love. And it just felt, I felt like this knife come through my heart. And she touched so many people with her vulnerability in that room. And and Clubhouse is a room of strangers. We don't know each other. We, you know, and nobody knows anything. But I could feel the whole room just reaching out to her and just wanting to hold her. 
And so I said, I said her name and I said, um, I don't know many things, but I know this one thing. Your purpose is not to be hated by the people you love. And I just want to ask those of you who are in this room, if you feel love for Maya in this moment, then you just click your microphones. And it was like a fireworks display went off in the room. And I just said, Maya, look, just look at what's happening here. Look at the impact of your vulnerability. Look how much you've touched the hearts of people here. Look how loved you are. And this is by just being vulnerable and opening up your heart. And Nick, what I'm finding more and more is that, you know, we're so used to wanting to fix the situation. We're so used to wanting to help people. We're so used to wanting to change them or, or make them get away from their pain. And there was a little bit in, I guess, what I did of that too. But it's just so easy to just love them no matter what, to share love, no, to understand them, to listen to them, to hear them, and to just love them. And that love transforms us. We don't need to do anything. The power of love becomes so, so immense and so transformational that it extends beyond the borders of that room. It extends beyond the borders of this body. It extends beyond the borders of this dimension. That my mom could be so in love with my dad that she could die on the same exact day at the same exact time. And that I can feel them both around me still 50 years after they passed. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. explanation for that. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Oh man. I, I even got, I was getting chills just thinking about that. I, I mean, yeah, I just the vulnerability of people is, is so beautiful. And I, I love, you know, the, the few times I've talked to you or heard you, you speak, I, I just feel that from you. And it's, it's just so, so amazing. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about your, where, where were you, where were your 10 years as a monk? Where were you at in the world? I, and they were in Northern California in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. I was, a uh, it was a yoga group. Um, I was a disciple of a man by the name of Paramahansa Yogananda. And it was an offshoot community of his community called, his community is called self Relation Fellowship. This community was started by someone who was thrown out of self Relation Fellowship. Uh, and um, I just felt more attuned to the one who was thrown out than the one who, the ones who stayed. Um, <laughs> and so uh, this was after Yogananda had passed, many years after he had passed. Um, but even here, here, here to me, like, like look at even at this story. And again, it's coming through my eyes, which are, are deluded, surely. But here's this great teacher that comes, that shares this message of just love and, and, and the power of what love can do and, the, and the, the power of meditation and the power of that silence. And shortly after he passes, his top disciples are fighting with each other and, and throwing each other out of the organization. And, and there have to be reasons that we don't know of that, you know, I know the reasons that he says, I know the reasons that they say, it's probably neither one of those. But here's the sense of Yogananda saying, they'll make a religion out of my practice, but it's never meant to be a religion. Because as soon as it becomes a religion, there becomes a hierarchy and there becomes a sort of this way of doing it. The world that I see really now is a horizontal world. When you look at the way a mosaic is put together, it doesn't have pieces that are above each other, teaching, fixing, changing, directing. All of the pieces broken or whole, all the different colors, all the different textures, all the shapes and sizes, all they do to make the mosaic happen is hug each other and they hold each other. 
And so it's in the simple love again of just this simple image of artistry. And if it's so simple to see in the artistry of a mosaic, I want it to be that simple in the artistry of our lives. That all we need to do is love each other no matter what somebody does. Because if you think that everybody wants to be listened to and heard, when they're not listened to and heard, my developmentally delayed daughter taught me that when people can't understand her, she yells. When she yells and they don't understand her, she tantrums. When she tantrums and they don't understand her, she attacks. And she has no choice because she doesn't, as yet, she's not able to communicate. I'm, she's 31 years old and I've never had a conversation with her. Hmm. But she taught me through the power of her actions. In the midst of her rage as she was running to me, I said, Elisa, I love you more than anything in the world. I would give anything to understand your words right now, but I can't understand your words. Talk to me without words. And she stopped and smiled and said to me, I am daddy. And I said, how the expletive deleted are you doing that? And she put her <laughs> finger to the side of her head. And she made me understand that she was telepathically putting thoughts in my head, but I didn't even trust it. I said to her, you little son of a gun, have you been putting thoughts in my head this whole time? <laughs> because I had thought that I had heard them. I thought that I had seen them. And she said, yes, daddy. And we started to laugh like you laughed, but our laugh was uncontrollable and contagious for about 20 minutes. Wow. And after that, from that moment on, she never yelled, she never tantrumed, and she never attacked ever again because she had found a way to tell me what she wanted and I found a way to listen to her. If that were the end of the story, I would be in bliss because I now have a relationship with my daughter I never had before. Right. And it's not all the time. I don't understand her all the time. I can't feel it all the time, but a lot of the time. But then I looked at the places I was working, the corporations I was with, the families I was working with, the government places I was, I was invited to be at. This, the presentations to corporations that I was giving, the prison system, the healthcare system, the education system. And I saw my daughter's action in every single one of them. When people speak and they don't get heard, they yell. When they yell and they don't get heard, they create chaos. When they create chaos and they don't get heard, they, they try to destroy. Look at what's happening in our political parties right now. Yeah. I mean, it couldn't be more obvious. <laughs> yeah, right. right. And, and so it's so like this, the, the, the subtlety and the coincidence and, the, and the, I don't have the right word, but, but the craziness of this situation doesn't elude me that a 31-year-old girl who's never had a conversation with anybody in her whole life could give me the answer to how to have real conversation. Because if we would listen, no one would need to yell. If we would listen when they yell, we wouldn't, they wouldn't need to create chaos or tantrum. And if we would listen when they tantrum, they would never need to attack. That's true for our own bodies. It's true for our environment. It's true for our businesses. It's true for our healthcare. It's true for everything that exists in the world it all follows that same pattern. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the visions that popped into my head when you even equated it to politics, I just was thinking, man, it is so true of just the tantrums and yeah, just listening would just like soften it or if we all just spoke <laughs> and, and on the other side listened to the other side and yeah. vice versa. I mean, man, what a powerful powerful story with your daughter yeah that is just so beautiful and man um she, she's the greatest gift i've ever been given but don't get me wrong there were times where it was desperately hard oh man uh, yeah i bet so shift gears a little bit so you you have you said you hitchhiked around the world where where was your favorite place that you've gone to wow I know it's a very tough question. I, I, if people ask me, it's I'm always like, "Come on, man!" But I love asking it because it brings up uh, conversations of of travel, which I love. 
the place that comes immediately to mind because it had nothing to do with anything that I was doing was I was on a motor I was on a motorbike in the Isle of Corfu off off of Greece, mm. and it's a small island that you could take a motorbike and drive around the island, and I was just driving and, and it was just exquisite. There were olive fields all over, and and I was driving in these this this one field was being um, the olives were being picked by these women wow. with their with their babushkas and they were filling up their babushkas. And one of the women saw me driving by and came running down to where I was driving. And she went like this. We didn't understand the word of each other. She just went like this. And I, th I thought, well, what happened? Did I do something wrong? And suddenly these 65 year old women, 60 year old women came running with their babushkas full of olives and just emptied them out on the, on the, on the ground in front of us. And we sat together and another one brought a bottle of wine and another one brought a bottle of wine and we sat in the middle of this field with wine and olives and another one went to get a loaf of bread and another one went to get cheese and suddenly we were having this beautiful picnic with people i was i was 18 years old they were 65 it didn't matter what age we were we were sitting in these fields just loving each other without speaking one word. Yeah. And just sharing together and, and feeding each other these beautiful delicacies. Oh, my God. You know, uh, it was just like absolutely beyond anything you could ever imagine. Right. And how would it even be possible that people would be that loving and caring to yeah. take a complete stranger like myself and just show that much love to me? I'll never oh. forget it. You know, there was another time that I was on the on a street corner in, in Paris. And I suck as an artist, but I didn't want to take a camera with me because I didn't want the responsibility of losing it. And so I took some charcoal pencils and a little pad and I just, I, I carried them in my bedroll and I just you know took them out when I got to a place and I just would draw and I, I'm telling you, I suck as an artist. <laughs> but somehow whenever I would take out my, my pencils and my pad, people would congregate. And I remember this, this first time that it happened was on a street corner in Paris where people were sort of up at the up. At the up. But suddenly people started to sit down and look at me. And I think they just sort of felt, you know, um, pity for me that I couldn't, couldn't draw so much. <laughs> and, and we just sat together. And, and again, people started to bring food around. And just we've we fed each other with laughter and foods um, from the villages and from the and from the people. And again, some people spoke English. I didn't speak much French, and we really couldn't communicate. But the words would have only gotten in the way of that was there. And they're just so. What I want to share through these moments is the world hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. People are so beautiful and so loving and so caring. And what we see sometimes on the news is so different than what actually is. Right. It doesn't matter what political party you believe in or don't believe in. When you ride through the streets of a town and you sit on a corner and you open yourself up to the experience, the experience of that experience, the experience takes over. And we no longer define ourselves by what we think or who we believe in or what we do. We just define ourselves by this love that's taking place right in this moment. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. It's, some of my favorite moments in life have just been experiences like that when I travel. But that one, especially uh, when you were having your picnic, I that is like, if I, whenever I dream of going to places, that is like what I want. That is like the yeah. story that I want to have happen of like, yeah, I'm just riding through this field and these women stop me and you know, it's like, hey, let's go to grandma's house. She's cooking this amazing meal or let's just have it right here. Let's bring the wine. Let's bring all this. Like that is like the epitome of, of what I look for when I travel. Those are the experiences. Like, sure, it's it's wonderful to see all the beauty of these places, but that is where the true beauty comes. Like you said, is having those experiences. And I mean, 18 years old and you're doing you're, you're sitting there with these 65 year old women and again not communicating but communicating so much love through food and wine and just that experience of just being there it's just so incredible yeah and and 
And love has no language. Right. It has every language. It has silence and it has words and it has power and it has dignity. And so in the world that we live in where there's so much turmoil, we can share our love in the silence of our presence by just bringing our presence of love to that situation. And I'm watching it happen more and more and more and more people that I speak to and more people that come into my room and more people that, that come and share with me that I feel so loved. Like, here's the miracle of what's happened in my life at this point. I thought I was doing a service to people to hold a space for them to feel loved and accepted and listened to and heard and acknowledged and validated. What I had no idea of what I could have never anticipated was that the universe would do the same thing for me a thousand times more that it would love me through the voices of so many different people that it would accept me in the kindness of people like yourself who met me for just a moment and invited me to sit more with you that it would listen to me and hear me and that it would acknowledge me on this beautiful journey that I'm on. This world is more magnificent than I could ever dream possible. The people in this world are more magnificent than I would have ever known. And every one of us, myself included, just want to be loved and accepted, listened to and heard, and acknowledge and validate it. Yeah. I mean, that that was the beginning of this podcast was me sharing my story, you know, and, and not doing it for the, the claps. But like, I always tell people, you know, I talk to a lot of people now about their sobriety journey, and it is so different for everybody. But, you know, it's like, in those moments, you, you, that is what you want. Like when I was going through it at my worst, what I wanted to be was seen as a human, not as Nick, like this crazy alcoholic that is fully jaundiced. And I, I look very sickly, like I do not look well, but what I wanted to be seen as in that moment in my darkest times was as I wanted to be seen as, as a person and wanted to be loved. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be all those things. And when I started to feel that empowerment, that was when I was like, okay, I'm going to, I, I have to have those experiences. That That is what is going to shape this, this world and this life of mine, you know, is just giving people that space to, to have that, you know? And then again, yeah, when I've opened myself up, like it has been so enriching to have these conversations with people, even people that I know very well, I'm learning so much about, or, that I don't know. I, I love hearing your story. Everybody's story is so brilliant and beautiful. I would love if we have time to share one more story with you. Oh, absolutely. So as I mentioned, I've sat with some of the richest people in the world at their dining room tables, not in their lecture halls. I've gotten to know their children. I've gotten to speak with their parents. And I've also known the poorest of the poor. But one of the people that influenced me probably more than anyone else, uh, obviously my daughter's there and my wife is there, which I have stories to tell you of those people as well. I already told you my daughter was a homeless man on the streets of San Diego. I was walking downtown one day and I was just drawn to go up to this man who was sitting where the pavement meets the wall. His back was against the wall, his butt was on the pavement. And I just walked up to him and he and I saw his hat there and I put a dollar in his hat. And I stood there and I, I was just staying in there with him and he said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you gave me my dollar. I thank you for it. But what are you doing? What are you standing here for? I said, there's something about you that intrigues me. I just want to spend some time with you. He said, thank you very much, but I can't do that. I, I have to make money. And if I'm talking to you, I won't make any money. And I need to make money because I, 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 I need to take care of other homeless people here because they don't do as well as I do. And I just, I have my brothers and sisters I have to take care of. And I said, I completely understand. How much money will you make in the next half an hour? 
He said, I make $5 a half an hour, $10 an hour. I said 17 hours a day. So I make about $170 a day, which is goes to help me take care of my family and my, my family and my people here. And I looked into my wallet and I saw I had a $50 bill. And I said, I'd like to give this to you. And he said, what are you giving me $50 for? I said, just because I want you not to worry about the time we're spending together. And he said, dude, you're crazy. You can sit down with me if you want. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> and, I, and I sat down with them. And I said, keep your hat out because even as we're talking, I bet people will give us money and they'll give you money. I don't want any of your money. And it took him about 20 minutes to open up to me. And finally, when he opened up, I said to him, Corey, you sit on the street corner, you watch thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people pass by you. If you could gather them all in a stadium or, or an auditorium and you could have a moment to speak to them, what would you say? He didn't miss a moment. He said, I would tell them to do what you're doing, to take 10 minutes out of the course of their life and just sit with someone they don't know and ask them how they're doing. And I said, Corey, that's so beautiful, but why? Why of all the things you could ask, why that? Like, that's a beautiful thing to do. And he said, let me tell you a story, Danny. You've told me a few stories. I said, I would welcome that so much. He said, I hate being homeless. I'm ashamed of myself. I'm embarrassed by my position. I can't believe that I have no place to go to to get away from all of this. I feel like a failure. I feel like a, I feel like a, a, a scorn on society. There are very few things that make me feel worse than I feel about myself than that, than the feeling I have about myself. Except people who come by and treat me not like a human being, not even like an animal, but like a thing. People come and they kick me and they beat me and they punch me and they spit on me and they yell obscenities to me. I was sleeping here one day and a man started urinating on me and I, I woke up and I said, what the heck? People steal my money. And so I decided at one point, enough was enough. I hated my life. People hated me. The street right behind this is a dark street. Nobody walks on that street. And so I decided that night I was going to go to the dark street where nobody walks. And I was going to take my life. Two minutes after I had that thought, a man in a three-piece suit came up and put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, brother, how are you doing? And I did the same thing to him that I did to you. I said, you don't want to know. Keep walking, sir. You're really not interested. You could give a damn. You don't really care. Just keep walking. Do your important things. I'm not important to you. Just keep walking. And the man sat down next to me. And he said, there's no way that's going to happen, my friend. I want to know how you're doing, just like, just like you did, Danny. And he said, I don't know why. Maybe it was because he had a three-piece suit on. Maybe it was because I thought he was important. Maybe it's because I was, I was disheveled and, and dirty and my clothes were torn and ripped and my box was ripped and torn. But I started crying into his shoulder. Crocodile tears, big tears that I haven't cried in years. And he just put his arm around me. He said, it's okay. There are lots of tears in you. Let them come. Tell me why you're crying. He said, Danny, you know, it only took about 10 minutes for me to empty myself, to, for me to tell him the important things that I needed to tell him. And I never saw him again. I wished he would have come by. I wish he would know that on those 10 minutes, he saved my life, hmm. that I was going to kill myself that day. But because of him, I couldn't kill myself because a man, an important man in a three-piece suit came up to me and cared enough about me to take 10 minutes out of the course of his life and ask me how I was doing. He said, that's what I would tell people to do. That story moved me so much. Mm. There's something called the butterfly effect mm -hmm. where a butterfly flaps his wings in one place and a wind blows to give energy to a city. 
Corey's story touched me so much. I made a vow that day that as much as I could, as many times as possible, I was going to share Carol Corey's story wherever I went, whether it was mm-hmm. in boardrooms or podcasts or TV shows or lectures or speeches or talks or, or gatherings. I was going to try and share Corey's story as often as I could. And so I want to share it with your audience. Mm. Uh, and I want to ask the people in your audience to take 10 minutes out of the course of their life. What's 10 minutes out of the course of your lifetime to go up to someone you don't know and just ask them how they're doing. Don't try and fix them. Don't try and help them. Don't try and feed them. Don't try and do anything for them. Just love them and listen to them because you have no idea whose life you might save in those moments. There are now millions of people that are doing the 10 minute pledge Mm. that are going up to people that they don't know and saying, how are you? And are listening. And there's a revolution that we're starting called the revolution of listening. It doesn't cost anything to be a part of it. It doesn't, you know, there's no membership fee. There's no place that you have to attend. All you have to do is do that one action. Who knows? It might be contagious. You might want to do it with your spouse. You might want to practice it with the people that work for you. You might want to ask your boss or your, or your, or your, uh, or the owner of your company. How are you doing? You might want to do it to your children. You might want to go to a hospital and ask somebody how they are. Who knows how contagious this 10 minutes could be. So I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you. Yeah, uh, man. Thank you for sharing Corey's story. That is unbelievable I, I absolutely am honored that you would share that and yeah just the power the power that is humanity of just sitting and talking to somebody seeing how they're doing yeah goes a long way um so before i let you go i'm gonna ask you the same thing that Corey asked you, or that you asked Corey, because i i actually end all my episodes with that of if you had the ear of everybody in the world what would you say to them I would say love for no reason. You know, I speak to a lot of people. And there was a woman that I was speaking to about a month ago. And she shared with me vulnerably her heart. I had never met her before. And I said to her, I want you to know how much I love you. I really, really love you. And she responded back to me saying, you're so full of crap. You don't even know me. How can you love me? And I said, that's a good question. I said, but if we can hate for no reason, surely we can love for no reason. I don't need a reason to love you. My wife taught me that. I met my wife at a moment in time where I had lost $300,000 because my manufacturer, I had had a clothing line at that period of time. And my manufacturer was supposed to send to me clothing that he had made that we were gonna ship three days later to fulfill over a million and a half dollars of orders for that season. And he called me up and said, Danny, I don't know how to tell you this, but I haven't made one stitch of clothing. Yeah, I have nothing to give you for your delivery of your orders. And I said, how could you have done that to me? He said, I just, I just, it was too much. I couldn't do it. My heart went into palpitations. Immediately, I started receiving calls from my debtor saying, when are you going to pay us? Will you owe us money? I'd never owed that much money. I'd never owed any money before in my life. Yeah. I had no money. My body was, my body was acting up in in rebellion to me. And here comes into my life a 21, a woman 21 years, my junior, gorgeous woman from Argentina, and said, I love you. And I just looked at her. I remember to this day, I looked at her and I said, why? Why would you love me? I have nothing. I'm at the bottom of my barrel. I don't, my health is done. I'm 21 years older than you. I have no money. Why would you love me? And she said, you're the first person that asked me ever why I love you, love them. 
I love you because I love you. I don't need a reason to love you. In that moment, I felt so invincible that I made a vow to myself that I would try and share that feeling of invincibility with others by loving them for no reason. And so when this little girl said to me, you're crazy, you, you, you're, you know, you're just full of it. And I was able to say to her, people hate for no reason. Why can't we love for no reason? She got it. So I would invite people to love for no reason, to listen and hear the people that are around you and to accept people as they are. We don't need to fix or change or help or do anything. Be like the pieces of a mosaic and just hug each other for no reason. Oh, that's brilliant. And I, yeah, I love, I love that. Love for no reason. Cause you can't, I mean, everybody hates for no reason. Yeah. Wow. Well, Danny, I truly appreciate your time. I appreciate your just beautiful look at life and, and sharing that with me and with my listeners and, yeah, man, I, I can't thank you enough, and I, I've loved connecting with you. It's it's fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Well, I love you, brother, and I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you so much. It's my honor. Take care, brother. All right. See you. Bye. Ciao. Thank you for listening to the Beautifully Human podcast. To hear more beautiful stories from beautiful humans, follow us on Spotify and rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Wanderlust Moon Duo. Peace signs up. <laughs>